came in. Good morning, everyone. I'm Karthik Nayak, and today I'll be talking about our work on locality preserving abuse run. This is joint work with Gilad Hubert, Rafael Ling, and Elaine. So let me start off by quickly defining an oblivious RAM. So in general, in a computation, you have a request sequence i. And the request sequence looks like the following. I want to read memory location a1, followed by write something to memory location a2, and so on and so forth. And your CPU actually executes this uh, access pattern and sends a response back. The problem we are trying to solve with an oblivious RAM is to hide which addresses are accessed in this request sequence. So we assume that you have an adversary which is snooping on your address bus, but it cannot look into the contents of the CPU, for example, or the actual contents of the data in the memory. For instance, you can think of your data as being encrypted. So what you want is to convert this logical access sequence into a sequence, let's call it ORMFI, in such a way that the adversary does not learn what I is. So for security, you want for any two access patterns, I and I prime of the same length, that ORAM of I is indistinguishable from ORAM of I prime. So typically, when you're trying to obfuscate these accesses, you will end up accessing more memory locations than uh, you would do in a logical sequence. And that is why one important metric that you're trying to reduce is bandwidth, or the number of memory locations you access for every logical access. So separately, in systems, another notion that is very important is the notion of data locality. So what is data locality? If a memory location is accessed, a nearby memory location will be accessed soon enough. For instance, if, you're, if you have a file server in such a way that, let's say, a file spans five blocks, then if you're accessing the entire file, after accessing the first block, you will end up accessing uh, the, next five block, the next four blocks as well. And you will have a similar observation if, for example, if you have uh, range queries. And this notion of locality has motivated the design of hard disks and SSDs uh, that we have today in such a way that when you're accessing the first block, that is expensive, and accessing the subsequent nearby blocks are cheaper. So at this point, I would like to distinguish between this notion of locality, which is spatial locality and temporal locality. So temporal locality says, if I access a memory location soon enough, I will access the same memory location again. And that has motivated the design of memory hierarchy and caches and so on and so forth. But over here, we are only concerned with spatial locality. So the problem is that with an oblivious RAM, this, this obfuscation of accesses inherently break locality. So in an ORAM scheme, let's say if I'm accessing memory location 5, I end up accessing 5 and some more spurious uh, memory accesses. But more importantly, after performing this access, I end up shuffling my data around. And this such shuffling inherently, break, inherently breaks data locality. So the question we ask in this work is the following. Can we construct a bandwidth-efficient ORAM that preserves data locality? So this notion of bandwidth efficient is important over here. But before we understand this question, let us first define what I mean by locality. So at a very high level, locality is just the number of head seeks or the head jumps or the number of discontinuous regions that I'm going to access. So if I'm making one or I'm access, and let's say your head moves in the following fashion where I have access three blocks, this contributes three to bandwidth and one to locality. And let's say then the head performs a jump and makes another set of accesses, then correspondingly my locality and my bandwidth would increase. So at a high level, I'm just trying to reduce the number of head seeks or head jumps. So if reducing locality was my only goal, then the following simple solution would just work. I'll, I'll just scan the entire memory, and then I'll get a locality of one, which is great. But the problem is that your bandwidth is going to be very high. So in that sense, I'm trying to reduce both locality and bandwidth together. And intuitively, I'm trying to get both of them to be polylogarithmic in N. So the first question is, can I actually get this? Turns out we show lower bound that you cannot have something like this. And in general, we show that we show lower bound which says, if you want sublinear locality, then that implies linear bandwidth. Well, this is not great, but the, on the flip side, we, we show that if you have some leakage, perhaps something is possible. So the next question we ask is, 
whether we can construct a bandwidth efficient ORAM scheme that preserves data locality while only leaking the lengths of the contiguous regions that are accessed. And under such a leakage, we show the first ORAM scheme with data locality. So specifically, if your access sequence is making T requests in such a way that it spans K discontiguous regions, then we show an ORAM scheme which has a bandwidth which is T times polylogarithmic in N. So if you know the ORAM literature, this is something similar to what all ORAM schemes do. But the main part of the result is that we have locality that only depends on the number of discontiguous regions, and the blow up is a factor of polylogarithmic in N. Specifically, it does not depend on the number of memory locations T that is accessed. We achieve this while using a client storage, uh, while using a constant client storage. And interestingly, for some part of a computation, we end up using two disks instead of one. And that is uh, essential to, uh, in our scheme to achieve locality. So, and as I mentioned earlier, we end up leaking the lengths of the K regions that we are accessing. So in a nutshell, we have this upper bound and the lower bound. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on the upper bound result. So before I explain how to achieve this for a, a standard ORAM, let me simplify the problem and show, it, show how it works for a, a simplified scheme uh, or a simplified input pattern. So in general, my request pattern can look like the following. I want to read memory locations 2, 3, 4, and then write to memory locations 7 and 8. So t equals 5 and k equals 2 over here. So the first simplification I'm going to make is that instead of these requests coming one by one, I know my range is offline. So I'm going to, read, so I'm going to know ahead of time that I'm, the access is, is going to be for ranges 2, 4 and 7 to 8. And a second simplification I'm going to make is that I will only allow reads for now. So let us see how we can achieve this for this simple scenario. And the high-level idea is to use what we call read-only range ORAM. And the idea is very simple. Instead of storing data in one ORAM, I'm going to store data in log n different ORAMs, ORAM 0 to ORAM log n, or log n plus one different ORAMs. So ORAM 0 stores my primitive data blocks, the way you would think of storing data in your ORAM. ORAM 1 stores n over 2 blocks. But each block is now a super block, which is a concatenation of two, blo two primitive blocks. So block 1 is block 1, 2. The second block is 3, 4, and, and so on and so forth. So you have n over 2 super blocks of size 2. And in general, ORAM i is, has n over 2 to the i super blocks, each of size 2 to the i. So the important invariant that we have over here is that all ORAMs should store identical information. So if I'm accessing some block i in ORAM 0, it should be the same as the, the primitive block i in any of the log n ORAMs, or log n plus 1 ORAMs. So let's say now I want to access a range of size 2 to the j. If it's something smaller than 2 to the j, I can pad it to the nearest power of 2. The observation is very simple. A range of size 2 to the j is covered by two super blocks of size to the, 2 to the j. And if you think about this for 10 seconds, you'll realize that this is true. And which two super blocks? I can evaluate this by some simple math. So now, if, if I want to access a block of size 2 to the j, I'll just go to ORAM j and perform my access. So that will have a bandwidth of 2 to the j polylog n. The ORAM has a blow up of polylog n, and each block has size 2 to the j. In terms of locality, observe that this is independent of 2 to the j, because whenever I'm accessing these chunks, they are of size 2 to the j together. So the reason why this is a read-only ORAM is because we want this invariant which says all ORAMs should store identical information. And if I were to update this range in ORAM j, I need to do it in all of the other ORAMs, and that breaks either bandwidth or locality. So in order to support writes, we use a slightly generalized data structure, which we call a range tree. And a range tree is the following tree, where, again, leaves are the primitive blocks, and they are sorted by addresses. The distinction from what we were doing in the last slide is that over here, these leaves could contain discontiguous blocks. 
For example, over here, it's one, two, five, and six. Blocks three and four are not there. And every internal node has super blocks, which are a concatenation of its children. And they are, again, replicated, and so on and so forth. And, and looking ahead, each of these levels will be stored in different ORAMs. And in order to support, uh, so if you think about what we did for read-only range ORAMs, it is this full range tree consisting of all n elements. So if you were to support writes, I'm going to use a hierarchy of range trees. So where the largest tree contains all of my data, and then I'm going to have many smaller range trees. And I'm going to maintain these two invariants. The first invariant is the range tree invariant, which says within a tree, blocks are consistent. That is, uh, if I'm looking for a primitive block, it will be stored uh, at all of these different heights, and each of them will have the same information. Uh, information. And the second invariant that we maintain is that smaller trees are fresher. That is, across these ranges, blocks may not be consistent. But whenever I, I have two blocks across trees, the smaller one will be the fresher one. Or smaller trees act as a cache or a stash for a larger tree. So let us see, uh, with this data structure, how, how we can perform an axis. At a high level with an ORAM, each axis consists of two parts. First, I fetch some data and store it on some contiguous locations on the server. And then I engage in a maintain or a rebuild process where I'm going to write this data back into the ORAM data structure. So let us see how to do each of these in part. Let's say I have a request which says read some uh, locations as comma t. So for range trees, which have a root size smaller than this range, all I'm going to do is access the root. For range trees with, that are larger, and I now need to find two super blocks that store this range as comma t. So earlier with the read-only range ORAM, this was easy because I could use some simple math and figure out where these two, two, where these two super blocks are stored. But now it turns out uh, I cannot do that because my data need not be a set of all n memory locations. So in order to actually find which two these blocks are, we will use a separate auxiliary data structure, uh, which would be oblivious. At a high level, if you use, if you perform some sort of uh, a binary search on top of an ORAM, uh, that data structure should be sufficient to uh, obtain these two blocks. And then I'm going to access these appropriate blocks from ORAMJ, where ORAMJ uh, where j is log of t minus s plus 1. So, and at the end of this, I have data from each of these ORAMs, all written to a server, and the same block can be repeated multiple times, and I need to perform some sort of deduplication to get freshest range s comma t. So, let us try to analyze the locality of this algorithm, and again, remember, locality is the number of discontinuous accesses or the number of jumps. So for the first step, we have, we're just making up to log n discontinuous accesses of size of, uh, of, of the size of uh, the range. For the second step, for accessing the oblivious data structure, uh, we are again making polylogarithmic accesses, but this is of size one, because all we are accessing in the data structure is some index. For the next step, when I'm actually performing this axis, again, I'm making polylogarithmic number of discontinuous accesses of the size of the range. And finally, in order to perform deduplication, we'll use some sort of uh, a locality-friendly oblivious sort. So for now, I'm going to punt on the oblivious sort. I'll, I'll revisit it when uh, we reach the maintain phase. But for now, if you would observe all of these uh, points, all of them do not depend on the range in terms of locality, or locality is independent of size of the range. So with that, let us see how we can perform a maintain operation or a rebuild operation. And, and the goal over here is to write this access data back into the data structure. So updating a range tree is hard. And it is because we want to store consistent values across different heights. So if you think of, of accessing a range of size k, and now I have to update it across all heights. For accessing the root, I'm going to incur a large bandwidth, because I'll have to download the entire data. 
And similarly, for accessing the leaves, I'm going to incur a large locality because I'm going to do it, I need to do it one by one. And the fix over here is to actually write in a smaller range tree and rebuild range trees. If, if you take a bird's eye view and see what we are doing over here, this is something similar to what rebuild operations, uh, this is how rebuild operations are performed in uh, hierarchical ORAMs in general. But the important constraint that we need to maintain over here is, is locality. So we require ORAMs that have a locality-friendly initialization and a locality-friendly rebuild procedure. Specifically, I cannot initialize an ORAM by saying I start with an empty ORAM and add blocks one by one. I need to do it as a batch. And an important ingredient turns out is a locality-friendly oblivious sort. And over here, we use bitonic sort. And we show that if you have two disks, then bitonic sort can be implemented with order log square and locality and n log squared and bandwidth. And this is where the notion of two disks come in uh, in our final result. All right, so we spoke about how to do read-only range ORAMs using a very specific range tree, how to do read and writes using a hierarchy of range trees. Let us try to see how we can move from offline to online. Again, the idea over here is simple. I have requests coming one by one. All I'll do is some sort of a predictive prefetching. Whenever I see my request sequence, if I see that the request sequence is discontinuous, I'll just access a block of size one. On the other hand, if requests are contiguous, then I'm going to prefetch a larger super block of double the size of what I did earlier. So if I have, so it, it just go, uh, grows uh, uh, geometrically. So if, if I have requests which are, which looks like two, three, four, five, six, followed by one comma four, first I'll access a block of size one, then a block of size two, then a block of size four, and then I observe that locality is not maintained when request sequence one comes in, and then I'll start all over again. And as we can easily see, a range of length L just requires up to log L accesses. So I can move from offline to online by throwing in another log N factor in terms of uh, both locality and bandwidth. So to summarize, here are our contributions. I discussed the upper bound over here now in the presentation. For the lower bound, uh, I would urge you to read our paper. But before ending, my talk, I would quickly discuss whether such a length leakage in an ORAM is reasonable. And I would first make an umbrella statement that this largely depends on the application. If lengths are already public knowledge, range ORAMs are useful, and then they'll give you efficiency because, uh, because of locality. However, on the flip side, I'll, I'll also mention that Range ORAM is a strict generalization of a regular ORAM. I can always turn off the locality feature by just not using predictive prefetching. And finally, in, uh, recently, people have considered trying to hide the access pattern length using differential privacy. Perhaps something like this can be used over here uh, to hide the length of uh, ranges. Let me end my talk by uh, posing some uh, open questions. The first open question, and to me this is the most interesting open question, is can we actually preserve the number of disks while achieving obliviousness? For instance, our solution uses two disks, and that stems from using a, a bitonic sort. It turns out that there has been some partial progress uh, through a subsequent work which was published in NDSS 2019. And over there, they assume a larger client storage and they are able to do this using a single disk. And the client storage that they assume is the size of the range that you have accessed. A second interesting open question over here is, can we have a, a locality-preserving op RAM, or an oblivious parallel RAM? And finally, until now, I have discussed everything in terms of polylog, polylog in N. So an interesting question is, can we get actual asymptotic efficiency? In fact, uh, a previous draft of our own work discusses uh, a better asymptotics for the same scheme that I described. And this work in NDSS 19 also talks about the actual asymptotics. So the interesting part of this work is that they use uh, a tree-based ORAM instead of a hierarchical ORAM uh, to uh, achieve locality. Thank you. 
and I'd be happy to take questions. So yeah, questions? If you have a question, please come to the mic. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>